Well, good morning, Journey. We are so glad to have you here for one service today um, in person and to those online. We're glad to have you here too. If this is your first time here at Journey, we're glad that you visited us today and we hope that you come back. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get worship started this morning because I know you have a busy day today, so let's stand and sing together. All shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. Oh, love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song gives found, cause there ain't no grave. There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna rise up out of the ground. Oh, there ain't no grave. Fear is a liar with a smooth and velvet tongue. Fear is the tyrant, he's always telling me to run. Oh, love is a resurrection, and love is a trumpet sound. If you walked out of the grave, I'm 
walk into. Sing it. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking to. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking to. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking to. Someone around you, then have a seat for us. Hey, good morning. Hey, Journey, thank you for joining us today. It is so good to be together. If you're here on campus or watching at home, and if you're a guest, a special welcome to you. If you stop by the welcome desk on your way out, we have a gift just for being here. Parents with students in our children's ministry, a couple announcements for you. If you have a kid in our kindergarten through third grade class, that's the big church room. We have a new pickup and drop off system. There are signs in the lobby detailing how that should go. There's also still time to sign up for camp at whitemillschristiancamp.com. We have a group going July 17th. We would love to see your kids there. Finally, last week at our cookout, we were able to raise $1,400 to help send kids to beach camp. That's because of your generosity, and we are so thankful. There's still time to give if you would like to do so. You can do so by giving cash out front at the cookout today, or you can scan the QR code in front of you on your chair, and you can give via the app. Once again, thank you so much for being here. Enjoy the service. All right, well, good morning. We're so glad you guys are here uh, what is the over or under that in about 20 minutes we're going to have about 50 people show up that did not, and some of you I saw got here real early, uh, and so make sure you download the app, you sign up for the emails so you have all of the information. It's packed obviously in here, we're doing one service today, we figure a lot of people are on vacation, uh, going to the beach, so we're doing one service. There is some cookout afterwards, it's free, but if you feel like you want to help donate towards beach camp, there's buckets out there, we're not going to turn it down, but feel free on your way out to grab a hot dog or a sausage, some chips, and some water. Uh, please pray for me. Uh, I am leaving right after the service to head down to beach camp. I'm going to be spending the week with 80 high school kids, um, and I am not cool enough. And uh, <laughs> I am already anticipating the eye rolls and all of the things this week, but I'm super excited to be going down there and spending time and teaching them uh, this week. And so uh, make sure and pray for us. If you're a parent of a kid going to beach camp and you have any questions, see me after the service. I sent an email to you guys yesterday, but I know everybody checks their email regularly, uh, but all the details are in there for last minute stuff. But please feel free to grab me on the way out. I do want to say uh, I'm going to beach camp and I went to White Mills camp because we are in between youth ministers. Uh, we have hired somebody. Uh, he lives in Colorado and I'm like, you're coming from Colorado to Kentucky. Uh, not a lot of people do that. And so, uh, but he will, he will be here at the end of the month and you'll get to meet him and we're super excited uh, to be having him on 
the team. So it is 4th of July weekend, and there were a lot of fireworks last night. I'm sure there'll be more uh, tonight. And, and so uh, we are in between series, so we're starting a series next week. I'm super excited about it. It's called Little Cups of Joy. Uh, it's inspired by April and her shirts and coffee mugs, and so we're, we're uh, going to start. She doesn't know that, but we're going to have a lot of fun with that series, so we hope to see you uh, back for that series. But we're in between, and so it's also a day where we talk about freedom here as a country today and tomorrow. We celebrate the freedom, um, and so the question with freedom has always been for me, um, we have this freedom, so what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with the freedom that we've been given, the blessings that we've been given? What do we do with those things? And this is the same vein that we see that runs in faith. And there's only going to be one verse today. And, and so normally I'd use a lot more, but today I'm just going to use one verse and it's going to be my talking point. Uh, and it comes in Galatians chapter 5. And Paul is writing to this church. And here's what he says. He says, for you have been called to live in freedom. Okay, my brothers and sisters. So it's for a church, but this is a message that continues to us today. Don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature or just make it about yourself. That's kind of what he's saying is don't make it when you have this freedom in life, don't make it just about yourself. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. And so we've been given this freedom, not only as a country, but as people of faith, we believe that we have this freedom in Christ. And so what are we going to do with that freedom? And so today I just want to give you a few handles around this idea uh, this is stuff that we, I preach a lot and stuff, but this is stuff I wish I could just sit down and talk to everybody about over coffee or over dinner and just share these things. And here's the thing. I think for a lot of people, when we think about our faith, if we're honest, and we're going to be honest today, sometimes we have this tendency to think that Christianity um, is boring. That it's this thing that we do it, we go to church, we go to small groups, we do these things. But we feel like it's a part of our life, but it's not the most exciting thing. And some people might even say it's a little bit boring. And and, and so what I want to challenge you with today is I think the Christian faith um, isn't boring. You maybe are just practicing a bad version of it. Uh, You've been set free, and so what are you going to use that freedom from? Is it possible that God has a mission for you and a mission for us as a church with this freedom that we've been given? In fact, a lot of people, and I've talked to people over the years, that the reason they stop coming to church or stop attending church um, is, is they get kind of stagnant in their faith. It seems kind of boring at times. Maybe it feels like it doesn't matter anymore. And sometimes I think the reason we fall into that tendency is because we're not actively doing anything with our faith. And so today I want to give you a couple handles because we've all been set free in Christ. And so what do we do with those freedoms? What do we do with those things? And so I want to start with this point. It's going to kind of set the other ones um, in motion. And so here's what I want for you and for me when we experience the freedom that we have in Christ. The first thing is I wish for you that you will experience or have a courageous act of faith that costs you something. And here's what I, I mean by that, is I want you to get to a point in your faith where something, some opportunity, some thing comes along that you go out on faith and that it may actually cost you something. Now, this is what I wish for you, and here's what we're going to say is, you don't wish that for you, right? You don't want it to cost you anything. We, we like the easiness of it sometimes. But my hope for you is that you would have moments, not every day, not every month, not every year, although maybe, and maybe that'd be more helpful But you have this moment in your faith, in time and experience, where you feel this nudge. This nudge, this divine nudge, this internal nudge that you need to do something. You need to make a step, a courageous act that costs you something. A decision where you may not know where it's going to end up. But in your heart of hearts, you feel like God has nudged you to do this. Now, it happens all the time. Sometimes it happens, we'll be talking, I'll be preaching, and, and you'll feel something inside of you, this like emotion or this feeling, or you'll feel convicted or, or something's going on, and, and you have this moment, and, and we don't operate in guilt, and I don't believe God operates in guilt. And sometimes we, we think that, but it's like this internal nudge, this conviction, or like for some of you guys, like we'll be singing a worship song, and, and we've sang it a hundred times, but all of a sudden you get emotional, right? And, and you feel this inside of you, right? Don't ignore that. Pay attention to it. Pay attention to the nudge that you might have to do something. Now, one of the things that I think that we get wrong about the Christian faith is that so many times we, we say that, that we need to go deep. 
okay? And a lot of times people will accuse me of not being very deep. And I'm like, oh, I can get deep, but, but that's not always the point, right? Because see, here's what I think. I think it, I grew up in a church where the, the way that we knew something was deep is that it was really confusing and we didn't understand it. You, you ever grow up there? Like, that's deep. So, like, I, we do these classes, like these what is the Bible classes, and, and we, Rusty did what is Revelation. And some of the feedback I get from that is like, what did you just talk about? Like, what did you just tell us? Like, we've never heard these things. And that's deep when it's confusing. But to me, that's not deep. Deep is not about information. And deep certainly isn't about confusing information. Deep is transformation that results from personal obedience to God. That's deep. Deep is when you say yes to something and you don't know where that may lead. That's deep. This is the story we get in, in faith, by the way. We, we talked about it in the last series that Genesis all the way through the rest of the story up into Jesus and even the early followers of Jesus, it's the story of people, and these are real people, who had real choices they had to make and are called to things that make them uncomfortable. Now, we read these stories and we're like, oh, of course Abraham did this. Of course, if you listen to the podcast, Moses did this. There's some weird stuff in there. There's some stuff that I'm not sure I would have responded necessarily the same way that they did. Yet these are the stories that we read and that we study and we're inspired by. The other thing I would say this is most of the Christians that, that I have the most respect for, and probably you as well, I'm not impressed by what they know. I'm impressed by what they do. I'm impressed by the way that they live. It's the men and women who are faithful in decisions in spite of the fact that they don't always know how it's going to end or where it may lead. This is what deepens our faith, and this is why I, I want this for you. I want you to have this moment where there's this nudge, there's this thing, and in your freedom in Christ, you feel nudged, you feel led to do something, and in an act of faith, you go out and act upon it. I mean, for example, when does faith really become faith? Uh, to come here and just say, I believe all of this stuff, but then never act on it, is that really what faith is? Faith is trusting that what God said is true, and that even though I may not know the next step, I'm going to follow this idea, this idea, and I'm going to be faithful because I believe that God is faithful. And here's what I'll tell you. The people that I know that step out on faith like this, for a lot of them, they will tell you the story that this becomes the stake in the ground. This becomes the defining moment for their faith. In fact, some people, will, it gets emotional for them because they'll, they'll tell you about this time. I mean, Nathan and Justy last week shared, I mean, it wasn't easy for them to leave Journey, and it definitely wasn't easy for us to say goodbye to them. But they felt this nudge. They felt this calling to something else. And I'm telling you, people can argue all day long about whether there is a God or what God's like. But when you've experienced that, that internal nudge, and you said yes. I'm telling you when you do that, your faith will not go stale. Jesus is so brilliant in the way that he talks to the first century people that are kind of figuring this out. And, and Jesus doesn't sit down, say, sit down and take notes, or Jesus doesn't write a lot of books. In fact, we don't have anything that Jesus himself actually wrote. The invitation of Jesus was simply, come and follow me. Like, come and experience this. Like, there's this nudge to do this. And, and here's the thing, and, and I'm going to step on some toes, but that's okay because i got a third point that's really going to just tick everybody off. So might as well just start with it. Um, so here's the thing. I think when we make it about this and what we know and being right and all of this and less about following and answering that nudge or responding to that, here's what happens. Um, if you ignore the nudge of God long enough, you'll get cynical. And as a Christian, what happens so many times is you'll start complaining about the dumbest things. And we'll get in arguments about all of the wrong things. And that's kind of where we are right now as a country in Christianity. We've gotten so upset about all of the wrong things and complaining about some of the dumbest things. Rather than answering the call or paying attention to the nudge that God has us to maybe do something, to love people to share our stories, to answer the call of what Jesus may call in your life. And, and this is the story of our church, by the way. So, so you guys may not know this, but I had a really good job before this with a really good future. 
Like, honestly, like, people that know, and some of you are from the church that I worked at before, they were never going to ask me to leave, ever, right? But we felt this nudge to leave and to do something. And we started in that library right across the street with 20 kids. I remember the first week sitting around a table, people being like, I think I made a mistake. (laughs) It was a risk. It really was. But it was the nudge that we felt. And so that's what I hope for you, that you have this moment where there's this nudge and you respond in faith. Because you never know what hangs in the balance of that decision. So what does that look like for you? I don't know. Maybe for some of you, you need to get more involved in church. You need to start a small group. You need to be a part of a small group. You need to start a study. Some of you, when we go on these mission trips, you need to go. It would do every American a lot of good to get out of this place and to go to a third world country or developing country and just experience it. It would be so good for you. Some of you need to volunteer. And I know we talk about volunteering all the time, but every time you're like, I know I need to, but, you know, dot, dot, dot. Okay, but some of you, we need to get serious about this. You need to get serious about the nudge in your life that God is giving you. And I don't know what that looks like for you, but you never know what hangs in the balance of doing that. One day, Jesus is walking along with these guys, and and he meets this guy, and and he's talking to this guy, and, and there's this offer he makes them, this invitation of a lifetime to come and follow him. And so this guy, we don't really know much about him, but maybe he's been following Jesus for a while, but Jesus sees him, and there's this invitation to come and to follow him, and this is the invitation of a lifetime. And this guy, he looks at Jesus, he says, okay, well, I would, but the problem is I need to go and I need to bury my dad first. Is that okay? To which most of us would be like, well, yeah, that's a pretty reasonable you know, request. Like, let me go bury my dad. Well, here's what we know about the story. The problem with that story is his dad's not dead. And we don't know when his dad's going to die. But his response is, let me go and bury my dad. And the reason we know that, especially if you've been to third world countries again, you know that when someone dies, it's not like, oh, we take them here and we'll do the funeral like a week later. When someone dies in their culture and still places today, like when they die, the funeral's like an hour later. Because you don't want to let that body set. And so Jesus understands this. So this guy's like, okay, well, when's your dad going to die? We don't know. Like, he's not dead. And so, you know, and so Jesus has this, this line that it sounds so insensitive, but he's like, let the dead bury the dead. And, and here's what's going on. There's this invitation of Jesus to follow him. And particularly with this request, not only is it going to follow him, I mean, we're talking about history here. We're talking about something that's going to change the world. And the guy's like, hey, I got to get some stuff worked out and sorted out. You ever been there? I got to get some stuff worked out and sorted out. Do you know the reason that some of you don't answer the call of Jesus in your life? is because you don't think you're ready or you're good enough. Let me go ahead and tell you. You're never going to be ready and you're never going to be good enough. And there's always going to be something you got to work out and sort out. And in this moment, Jesus with this guy, he could have looked over. He said, hey, Peter, come over here. And brought Peter over. And he said, hey, Peter, you, you don't know this, but 2,000 years from now, people are going to name their children after you. Or Andrew, come here. You know any Andrews? Or Matthew, why don't you come over here? And I know what you're about your past, Matthew, but did you know that one day there's going to be Matthews all over the world? And part of the inspiration of those names are going to be you. And then he says, Hey, Judas, never mind. Nobody's going to name <laughs> their kid Judas, right? But they didn't know, just like we don't know, what hangs in the balance. And here's what I want to say. This guy, do you know his name? No. And we never will. Because he didn't answer the call. He didn't answer the nudge. He had stuff to work out and sort out. My point is this. I don't want you to miss what hangs in the balance of what God may be calling you to, that internal nudge. And it can look a lot of different ways. And I don't want to, I mean, some of you, like, it could be a relationship thing, right? Like, you just need to break up with them, right? You need to get out of that relationship. It's not healthy. 
Some of you, it's you need to, to give more. We'll talk about that in a minute. Some of you, it's you need to put yourself out there and volunteer somewhere. You need to give more, serve more. For some of you, it's you need to actually take this story of your faith and what God's done in your life and you need to share it. Which leads to my second thing that I hope for you and your freedom. I want you to know the feeling of being instrumental in someone's decision to follow Jesus. I can't tell you how big of an impact that is on the people that have been able to do that. In other words, I want there to be somebody in the world, in our community, maybe sitting in this room right now or listening online or somebody in the future, that when they tell their faith story, they mention your name because you were a huge influence on their decision to take the steps to follow Jesus. I would love for you to set one of our services and watch that person be baptized. I would actually prefer, I, listen, I, I love doing baptisms. I don't want to do baptisms. I want you to do the baptisms because you were the one that was influential in that story of that person finding Jesus and taking those steps. I want it to be the story of your neighbors, your friends, your family, because you took your faith seriously, you listened to that internal nudge, and you stepped out. I want you to be a part of someone's story. Let me ask you this, and this is convicting of me as as much as anybody else, but when was the last time that you showed up here, or any church if you don't come here normally, but when was the last time you showed up to church And you were nervous because you were bringing or meeting someone here for the first time. And you're like, Penny, worship needs to be really, really good. We we need him on that harmonica every week, right? (laughs) Because they said they're going to come this one time. Or Jeremy, please do not mess this up for me. Do not do your spit sermon again. When is the last time you evaluated what we do here on Sunday morning through the lens of an unchurched friend, unchurched neighbor, or unchurched family member? Because you come here and it's not about you, it's about what they experience, what they get out of it, and you want it so bad for them. And so when was the last time that happened for you? Because to be a part of someone's story, especially a story of faith, I'm telling you, it will change everything. That you've got to be a part of the story that changed things not only for them, but maybe for their family and their kids and maybe even generations of people. Because you took your faith seriously and you stepped out and you answered that nudge. And I'm telling you. Your faith will not be stagnant, your faith will not be boring, and you will experience the freedom that Jesus talks about if you take that seriously. And I want that for every single one of you. The third one. Here's the one I don't want to talk about, but I'm just going to talk about it for a second, okay? Um, The third thing I want for you when it comes to this nudge and this, this faith and this freedom is I want for you the freedom and the joy that comes from being generous, all right? The thing is this, I want you to have stuff. Stuff is great, right? Stuff is wonderful. I want you to have lots of stuff. But here's the thing, I don't want your stuff to have you. Because there's a difference. There's a difference between able to live a good life and have these things and these things having you. And, And here's what you know, when your stuff has you, it doesn't go well. I want you to be the type of person that's so generous with your stuff and the resources you've been given. The Bible uses this idea that that it's a direct reflection not only of who you are, all right, but whose you are. Life is short, and if you only make your life about you, and if you decide you only belong to yourself— And with the freedom and resources and things that we've all been given, if you only make it about you, I hate to tell you this, guys, but it is a very small life. You were designed, you were created not to live for your glory alone. Jesus makes it really clear that what we do with what we have is an indicator of who truly owns us and who is actually the Lord 
of your life. There, there's this one great verse where, where he talks about this idea where he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And it's true. Where my resources go, that's where my heart is. What I decide to do, listen, I'm not really going to ask this, but I can tell what's most important to every single person in this room if you just give me like three minutes to your bank account, right? I'll tell you what's most important to you. Here's the other thing that I'm learning about me. So let me talk about me and not any of you. God never has full access to me until he has access to everything that I have. He'll never have full access to you. And that's when you're free. And, and let me go ahead and say this, because I know some of you already put in the picture, you know, generosity. I'm talking about money and resources. Um, this is not guilt. We don't pass plates around here. We never will as long as I'm here. This is not about here comes the bucket again. Here's what I tell people every year. I talk about money two or three times a year tops. You just happen to be here, so I'm sorry, okay? Um, don't trust us. Believe that we're just trying to get rich off of you and what you've worked hard for. Fine. Don't give here. Give somewhere you can trust, you can believe in. This isn't a gimmick. This isn't a ploy. This isn't, oh, just give to us so we have more money and more stuff. It has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with you've been called to freedom. And you're not truly free if your heart is being torn somewhere else. You're not truly free if something else has a hold of your heart that you become and we become slaves to. And here's one more thing. Let me just throw this in there just for free in case you don't know. The other reason I think you should give to a church, whether it's here or somebody else, is at some point in your life, every single person is going to need the local church. You're going to need it. I'm telling you. I can't tell you how many funerals I've done. And I don't even know the person. I don't know anybody in the family. But I do the funeral and I have to speak the last words about this person because they don't have a church. Weddings that I've done for people because they don't have a church. They don't know a pastor. They don't have any of that. Counseling that I've done for people that I don't know. I don't know them. I don't know their family. I, but they're going through a crisis and they need help. Everybody needs a local church at some point. I'm telling you. So you need to have a plan for how you're going to support it. And I'm telling you this. Our potential here at Journey is extraordinary. We have almost no debt. Every time we have a need, I'm just like, hey, we need to do this. And, and you guys just come through. The generosity of many people here is amazing. And not only the generosity because of what we've been able to do since 10 years ago, 20 people in the library when I was like, this is a bad idea. But, but here's the thing. Listen, you don't always see the impact that Journey's made. You don't get to read the letters. You don't get to see the messages. You don't always get to go visit the places but I'm telling you, if you could catch a glimpse of the difference that you have made and we have made together over the last 10 years in this community and in families in this room, by the fact that every week you show up, the fact that every week some of you, you give generously, the fact that every week some of you, you come and you serve and you volunteer, you're making a difference. And I just wish you could experience all of the difference that's been made because of you and your generosity, not only with your resources, but also with your time and your willingness to answer the nudge, even if it's uncomfortable, of what God may be calling you to. And last one is this. This is going to be a little different, but this is for a specific group of people in this room or, or listening at some point in time, whether you're online or through the podcast or whatever. But this is for those of you who aren't Christian yet or are figuring out this church thing or trying to figure out if Journey is the right place for you. This is for the people who have questions we have yet to answer. For those of you that want this thing to be true, but you're hoping it's true. But listen, for so many of us, we've had bad church experiences. We've had bad experiences with pastors growing up. We've been hurt. We've been neglected. We've been abused at different times. Maybe we had great questions and got terrible answers, right? But you're, you're kind of leaning in a direction. My hope for you is that you would keep seeking, you would keep asking, and you would keep knocking. It's this idea that Jesus gives us that when we're confused or we have these things we're trying to work through, he says, if you would just keep seeking and knocking and asking. This is the model that, that Jesus gives us. And I believe this, that you can be a part of something that's happening here, and you can actually start to follow Jesus before you ever believe. 
Did you know that the guys that follow Jesus, there's a great verse in John, where they follow this guy for three years. And there's this little verse that's like, and then after he rose from the dead, they believed. Well, that's convenient, right? (laughs) They were following him for three years, and they weren't even totally sure they believed it all yet. But it changed their life. The other thing that we believe about here is this, and this is how we operate. You can belong way before you ever believe. We want you to be a part of this way before maybe you ever believe. But we want you to take that next step. We want to be here for you to take that next step. We want your friends and your neighbors to help be there with you, to be an influential part of your story. And we want to create an environment where it's safe for you to do that, for you to ask the questions, for you to raise your hand and ask the hard questions. We want to be there for you, and we want to create environments for you. And my heart's desire is that you won't give up the journey, and you won't give up the quest, and you'll keep seeking and knocking and asking. This is the freedom that we've been given. This is the freedom that we've been called to. I just lost a mint. That that you meet Jesus. There's this interesting passage that Jesus, one day, he's talking to these guys, and he's talking to in Syria, Philippi, and, and talking to some of his followers, and he says to him, he says, hey, what's, what's the word about me? Like, when people talk about me, like, what do they say? And, and they say, well, like, you know, some people say that you're like this reincarnated prophet. Some people say that you're like John the Baptist, which is weird because he was alive when John the Baptist was alive. But that's a whole thing. And, and, and you know, basically it's like some people just say, like, you're this old stuff. You're the same old thing. You're just a reincarnation of, of what's already been. And Jesus says to these guys, he says, well, who, who do you say that I am? Because that's the question. That's the question that at some point everybody in our faith journey and our freedom journey have to answer. Well, no, not who does Jeremy say that you are or who does your Sunday school teacher say that we don't have Sunday school here. But who does your small group leader say that you are? No, who do you say that I am? And Peter finally responds and he says, well, we think you're the Messiah. We think you're the son of the living God. And the reason he says that is because they've experienced too much. They've seen too much. They've experienced so much of that nudge in their life to follow, and Jesus has come through every single time. And that's what I want for you. To answer the question of who do you say I am? Well, I think you're the Messiah. I think you're Jesus. I think and and, and here's the part I don't want you to miss. Um The whole reason that any of this works is because of that, because of who Jesus is. Jesus says, I will build my church, my assembly, my gathering, my movement upon this, that I am the Messiah and that you believe these words to be true. And the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, the the idea that death itself will not overcome it. And for 2,000 years, it hasn't and it won't. And that's what makes faith amazing. That's what makes it worth pursuing. And if you're in a place where you feel like your, your faith is stale, maybe the reason you feel like that is because you've never acted upon it. And you've never really answered that question. Okay, you're the Messiah. And, and so when you nudge me in a direction, I'm going. And I'm answering that call. And maybe together as a community, we have the opportunity of being a small part of what Jesus began over 2,000 years ago. So let's not use our freedom just for ourselves, but to love others and to be a light. And I'm so grateful for the people here and the people that will get this right. I'm so grateful that all those years ago I felt that nudge and I didn't stay when it would have been easier to stay. And perhaps if we have a whole assembly, a whole congregation, a whole group of people that answer that call, perhaps we will be a small part of leaving the local church in America a little better off than we found it. So pay attention to the eternal nudge. Look for the opportunity to get uncomfortable and invite somebody to have that conversation. Make a plan for how you're going to support whatever church or whatever organization you go to that's making a difference in the world. And for some of us, keep seeking, keep asking, keep knocking, keep coming, and keep living in the freedom that we've been given.
Let's pray. Father God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for your words. Uh, we thank you for the truth that they bring. We thank you for the message of hope that we see. Um, God, I, I pray that for some of us in this room, and maybe in these moments, we're feeling this nudge. And I don't know what that nudge is. Maybe it's to be baptized. Maybe it's to get more connected to church. Maybe it's to be generous with our resources. Maybe it's to finally have that conversation with that person that we say we love so much and we want so much good for them, but we're just scared to have that conversation with them. And, and God, whatever that nudge is in our life, for some of us, maybe it's even bigger than that. Maybe it's to get out of a relationship that we know is leading nowhere good. For some of us, maybe it's to quit our job and to find something that fulfills our life more. I, I don't know whatever that nudge is for each of us as individuals. But give us the strength to answer that, to step out on faith, to live in that freedom that you've called us to. And God, for some of us, if we're just starting our journey or figuring this out, God, continue to in inspire us through your word, through the songs we sing, God, and continue to inspire us through the faith of people around us that we appreciate, not because of what they know and not because they say stuff we don't understand that makes them sound so smart, but because of how they actually live their lives. They're living like you. And they're following the call of you in their life. So God, help us to be a church that's true to that, that's true to the calling that we've been given, the urge and the nudge that we've been given to follow you. And so we love you and we thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. We take communion to remember what was done on the cross for us. And if this is your first time here at Journey, or if you've forgotten, there's those little cups of juice and that cracker by the doors. You can go grab one. We don't... We don't have um, a tradition that we do a journey where we, where we take the communion together. Um, but what we do have is, is community. And Jesus has asked us to take communion in our community together. So for this time when you, when you eat that cracker and you drink that juice, give thanks for the community that he's built for us here. And give thanks for that ultimate sacrifice that's made us whole. We're going to worship, and when you're ready, you can stand and sing with us.
the splendor of the King. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. Darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? Oh, we sing. How great. have a baptism, so have a seat for us. What a perfect sermon and worship today. I'm so proud of you, son. Ready? Just go with the F. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. But with Christ, I am saved. But with Christ, I am saved. I accept him in my heart to live with him forevermore. I accept him in my heart, and I will live with him forevermore. I accept him in my heart, and I will live with him forevermore. Amen.
We're so excited for Noah, and I can't think of a better reason to keep worshiping, so let's stand and sing together. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? The shame's done all that steel. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about Jesus. He makes a way.
just wonderful worshiping with you this morning in one service and seeing all these people. Um, we hope you have a safe and happy 4th of July, and we will see you back next Sunday. Please make sure that you stop um, at the cookout for our students' ministry. We'll see you back next Sunday. If you got pain, he's a pain taker.